Okay. So I am going to switch to share my screen here. And we're going to have everybody muted and then at the end, but you can work in the chat if you have questions along the way and we will catch up to those at the end. Okay. And if at any point there's you can't hear me or you lose cert signal, um, put it in the chat and then Barb will message me. She can send me something on my phone that way because I can't see the chat while I'm I'm sharing here. So um, just a quick a little bit of an agenda. So we're there is a disclaimer that I'll show here in a minute as far as this is should not be considered medical advice, um, but educational purposes. Um, we are gonna talk about chronic Lyme disease, some symptoms, diagnosis, and prevalence. Um, most of it is geared towards the US, but I do have some information for those of you that are tuning in from Australia. Um, Peter has been a, a great resource for me to have and connect with. Uh, and I know that if you've, you've met him through the group, he is a wonderful resource. So, um, but we're gonna talk a little bit about Lyme disease as well as chronic Lyme and Hopefully, if, if it's something that lacks education where you're at, you'll get some knowledge from there. Um, the bulk of what we're going to talk about is the role of genetics in Lyme disease. For me, uh, that was where, where true healing came in for me, was knowing my genetics, and uh, I'll go into more of that in, in detail. And then I do have some case studies and real-life examples that I'll share with you um, to show you some of the reports that I can have access to and also... Um, some reports that I can help interpret. So a lot of you on the registration said that you have access to your, your raw DNA or have had that, which is really great. Um, there's a lot of companies that you can do it yourself and analyze through, or you can also work with a practitioner like myself to help you kind of understand it as well as have some goals around that. Because I know when you're when you're sick, sometimes it's confusing, sometimes it's hard, it is a lot of information. So uh, we can work through that as well. And then we will have a question and answer. So once we go through the information, um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat as we go along or raise your hand once we get to that and I'll unmute you as we go. And then to wrap up, I'll tell you a little bit about some next steps that I could possibly help you with or some groups that you could join for additional support. Okay. Well, let me go back here. I'm missing some of the beginning stuff. Okay. So we're going to officially get started here. Uh, understanding chronic Lyme disease and genetics. I am Wendy. My name is Wendy Jean Hacker. It's the joke that I am a gene hacker, uh, biohacking, if, if you will. Um, but I go by on all of my social media as Wendy Jean. So you guys can find me on there and hopefully we can connect. So a little bit about me, I was misdiagnosed or undiagnosed Lyme disease for over 10 years. Um, my wonderful friend, Jill, who is actually on here tonight, I credit her for my healing. I, I moved into a home that I didn't realize had mold. And you know, through some sharing of hers and discussion, I found a doctor who was a clinical nutritionist who ended up being able to diagnose me with chronic inflammatory response syndrome from mold. Uh, I had MSIDS um, that if you're familiar with Dr. Richard Horowitz, he talks about. So multiple systemic infectious disease syndrome. So not only did I have mold, I had Lyme, I had Epstein-Barr, I had heavy metals, I had parasites. I was just overloaded. I had mycoplasma pneumonia. So unfortunately, uh, after about six months living in the home with mold, we discovered that there was black mold in my office, but by then I was bed bound most days. Um, I had a hard time remembering my son's name. I would put things in the refrigerator that were supposed to be in the cupboard and vice versa. And I really struggled. Um, but with Jill's help in finding a doctor uh, that was more of a functional doctor, I was really able to just get some relief of having somebody actually listen to me. Uh, I was 
guess the term is gaslit, gaslighting um, from my medical team. It was literally laughed at um, when I talked about mold and when I talked about Lyme. So at that point, I was a professional photographer. I had my bachelor's degree in photography and uh, worked at one of the United States' largest phot portrait photography companies um, until they did some realignment and then eventually had closed. Um, and then I started to do my own photography where I helped nonprofits raise money through photography. And it was very rewarding. I, I felt great. I was doing well. And then the fatigue came, the joint pain came, the hormone issues came. Um, and I was really shrugged off by my doctors that it was because I had a son at home, you know, who's young and a husband who had a very stressful job. And, um, you know, then years had passed and I took a nose dive. And then, you know, thanks to, to Jill and the doctors that I was able to find, I was really able to um, start understanding what Lyme disease was, um, but I still had, I still struggled with treatment. Um, fast forward uh, two years into treatment, my son was diagnosed with Lyme disease. So I kind of got put on the back burner uh, with my treatments. Um, my original doctor said I would need about four years of treatment to get back because how far um, my disease and co-infections had progressed. And in that time, I started to study and research Lyme disease. I started to study and research genetics, um, not knowing that it would become my future career and I would be where I am today speaking to all of you, but uh, I am very blessed to be here. So in, let's see, I was diagnosed in 2018. I did treatment to 2019 and 20. And then in 21, during COVID, I got a rash. I got a new tick bite. I live in the Worcester, Pennsylvania, which is one of the highest areas in the United States for confirmed cases of Lyme disease. Uh, and that treatment was difficult because I couldn't see my functional doctors because COVID shut them down. Um, as a photographer, I was not allowed to work. My business was considered unessential. And chiropractors and alternative doctors were, were not allowed to practice. Uh, but I was fortunate that within an hour from me, there was a Lyme literate medical doctor um, who put me on. Uh, I was on seven months of antibiotics, antivirals, um, pulsing them back and forth. Um, but it took a really big toll on my liver, which I knew some of my genetics and some of my body that I had a hard time with anesthesia. I had a hard time with antibiotics. Um, and I, on my birthday, I, I stopped treatment um, because I was having such adverse reactions to that. And then my other doctor that I saw was uh, back open and we did some more herbal treatments. Um, one of the big things that helped me in my journey was a Rife machine um, from Germany. It's a, I won't, I won't be able to explain it properly, but I will send some information on it. Um, and then I did really well for about two years. And then last year, um, I was diagnosed again with Lyme disease in June of 2023. But having done so much to my nutrition, my environment, my body, knowing what worked for me um, from a genetic level, knowing that herbs worked for me, knowing the Rife machine worked for me, I was able to clear that infection in about six months. So I have been Lyme negative since August of 2023. I am back to photographing. I am now a certified holistic health coach with training in functional nutrition, as well as a genetic practitioner. It's been a very long journey. Uh, I was very fortunate that I documented my journey with professional photography uh, and self-portraits. I am working with a publisher to publish a book on my journey. And I just really wanna share um, not just my experience, but the others see that you know there's hope for healing, that there's hope for um, that, just because people may not believe you or may not understand you that, you know, there are those of us that, you know, we've been there and we will support you. And that's, that's what brings me here today. So the disclaimer, uh, self decode is a personalized health service. Self decode is who I work for as a genetic practitioner. So I will be sharing some information from them. Um, I won't read this word for word. You guys can see this and I'll get a copy of this. Um, but we, we don't diagnose, we don't treat, but we do recommendations based on the human genome research as well as provide risk analysis and information. Um, we encourage you to always consult your doctor, your medical team. I know that's always um, the 
funny part when I say that, because most of us have given up on our doctors or understanding that our doctors don't necessarily want to listen to us. But um, we always have to say that you should talk to your medical care team. Um, in Pennsylvania, I'm allowed to share nutritional information, but I am not allowed to uh, do certain things because I'm not a nutritionist. Um, I know diff things are different in Australia, but in Pennsylvania, we have 51 states. Each state runs very different, uh, but I'm allowed to provide your education material. So um, out of my 17 clients, 17 of them should follow a Mediterranean diet. So I'm able to share that from an educational standpoint. So um, it's important to work with your doctor, understand your risks, especially if you're trying to change some medications or change your treatments. Um, it, you know, follow their advice the best that you can. However, those of us that are here, usually we're here because we feel like we've been failed by the medical community. So um, take that for, for whatever your journey is. I was very fortunate to have a good medical team. Uh, my neurologist is still unsure why I was having the tremors, although we know they were linked to Lyme disease at this point. Um, but when I say a team uh, with Lyme disease, you may need a cardiologist, you may need a neurologist, you may need a rheumatologist, um, depending on how your medical system is. Um, but I would recommend if you can afford or you can find a functional doctor, a doctor that's going to look at root cause and not just treat your symptoms, but kind of get to the root of it. And that's what I was able to do um, with my medical team, as well as understanding my genetics. So we're gonna talk some more about chronic Lyme disease. Um, it is starting to be recognized in America for chronic Lyme disease. Sometimes it's also called post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Um, the CDC here changes their mind all the time, whether it's recognized or it's not recognized, um, but we won't get into the politics of that. And I won't go through all of these word for word because most of you, if you're here, you're familiar with Lyme disease, but I will do kind of a top view. So Lyme disease, the origin and treatment is very controversial in the USA um, and not recognized in Australia um, because they don't, um, no ticks have shown the specific bacteria. Now they do recognize that it could possibly be transferred from mother to child, which is very controversial in the US. There are studies that show that from the Lyme disease.org website, but the CDC will not recognize that it could be transferred from mother to child. And for me, that's disheartening because my Lyme infection tracked back over 10 years, which meant that I would have had Lyme disease before my son was born. So we did pull a tick off my son when he was eight. Um, he did not test positive on a standard test, but when we had specialized tests, he had seven out of 10 bands. But given some of his sensitivities and health issues, I, I wonder if he was born with Lyme disease, but we will never know that. Um, but it is always something to consider and think about um, with you know, the ever-changing uh, controversy of, of Lyme disease. And um, it was first identified in Lyme, Connecticut, United States in the 1970s. So in America, it's, it's nothing, nothing new, unfortunately. It's just not talked about. Um, Lyme arthritis was first reported. Um, there was a book called Bitten and other books that talk about Lyme disease being a bioweapon and created by our government, uh, uh, I won't go into that, but there are plenty of books, plenty of research. If you use DuckDuckGo, you can find all kinds of things. Um, there also in the United States was a vaccine called Limerex, but it was taken off the market because it was causing uh, worsening symptoms and symptoms for people that didn't even have Lyme disease. So that was taken off of the market shortly after. I do know as an advocate for Lyme disease, they are trying to work on another vaccine. One of the other things that's actually really interesting is because it is a vector-borne illness, meaning that's transferred from animals to humans, they're actually starting to look into research to vaccinating the mice. So mice are one of the top carriers of, of Lyme, the white-footed mouse. So they are looking actually at vaccinating the animals that are carrying it um, and, and doing some different research, um, which is fascinating to me. And I will always, you know, try to share that with you as well as Peter. I know he shows a ton, shares a ton of information. Um, so a vector borne disease transmitted from humans through a bite. Um, they talk about ticks. I can tell you from the research through the, the government, the uh, National Institute of Health, 
in the vector borne illness working group, um, they talk about fleas, they talk about ticks, they talk about mosquitoes, they talk about human to human, they talk about mother to child. So again, it's those controversial things that depending on where you look, depends on how you might be able to contract the disease. Currently in the United States, there is uh, about half a million people alone uh, diagnosed. And if we look at those that are not diagnosed, we could take that times two, times three, times four. Um, there is a new documentary called The Quiet Epidemic. There are more people in the United States diagnosed with Lyme disease than all of the cancers combined, but it's not being recognized. It's not being talked about. The treatment's not effective. It's most people have to travel two to three hours to find a medical doctor that will test for it, let alone treat you for it. Um, and I know the frustrations just as much um, in Canada because it's uh, their, their cases are going up as well as those of you that are coming here from Australia. I know you have, have a very um, difficult time um, finding treatment um, or getting treatment paid for. So some of the symptoms, um, patients report here, fatigue, headache, cognitive complaints, sleep disturbance, uh, muscular pain, numbness, weakness. I mean, there are so many different things that can be contributed to Lyme disease. Now, the current treatment in the US is doxycycline of 14 days. However, I will share with you some of the top doctors and researchers from LymeDisease.org. If you're not familiar with that site, um, go check it out. They have the best information. Uh, there's also the uh, Global Lyme Alliance, which I'll, I'll make sure you guys have all these, these links to these resources, because especially those of you that are in Australia, if you don't have access to that, you can use some of the resources that we have here. So there has been a study done by Dr. Daniel Cameron. He is really big on Instagram and he talks a lot about Lyme disease in children. Um, he's part of the ILADS, which is the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society. Um, Lorraine B. Johnson, um, she's part of the LymeDisease.org. She's a researcher. And then Dr. Elizabeth Maloney, who's a partnership for healing and health. Um, they did a study that actually shows that uh, they had one trial with 14 of 22 patients for um, less than 10 days of treating with doxy was only 63% success rate. So we do have treatment options in America, but unfortunately they're very misleading. There are no proven studies that show 14 days of doxy will actually eradicate the bacteria. Um, if you have a Lyme literate doctor or functional doctor, they understand the life cycle of the bacteria is 21 to 24 days. So having those 14 days of treatment oftentimes leaves people still battling the disease or having lingering symptoms, or in my case, having more harm from those pharmaceuticals because I don't have the right enzymes to metabolize that in my body. So there were three trials, um, 77 out of 115 that had 11 to 19 days, had a 67, 67% success rate. And then there were zero trials with 20 days of treatment. So the treatment, um, I hate to say the CDC changes their mind all the time. Um, so a lot of doctors, you know, for children, they'll give them one dose of Doxy. For adults, they'll give them 14. Um, but it's really not a proven, it's it's not proven. There's no, uh, it's frustrating. Uh, I, I will just say it's very frustrating to know that what they're advocating for treatment is leaving people sick oftentimes leading to fibromyalgia diagnosis. There's now studies that prove that undiagnosed or untreated or fully treated Lyme disease increases the risk of cancer. So for, for everybody on here, you know, knowledge and knowing and advocating for your health, I know what my body was going through was not normal and I had a hard time getting people to listen. So, you know, I recommend journaling your symptoms there's a link I'll share on you where you can download some different things to, to kind of track and journal that. But um, even the treatments that are out there aren't always effective. So this is here for the, um, all the, the friends, the my new friends from Australia. Um, so there's no evidence of Lyme disease because of the specific bacteria in the ticks in Australia. 
However, there are other infections that are recognized. And I know those of you that are in the group with Peter, he really shares a lot with that. Um, and, but they do recognize that can be acquired through international travel. So um, if you go to nsw.gov.au, there is some information on there that you can figure out as far as lab testing. They recognize you know, some different um, facilities as well as some different options on there. So there is some information there for you guys. Unfortunately, even though that there's not evidence that the ticks carry that specific bacteria. So this is another thing that's uh, always um, uh, the rash. So it's often more than Lyme disease, um, often co-infections, other vector-borne illnesses, prolonged treatment. Um, the other issue with chronic Lyme disease is it's often misdiagnosed. Um, so co-infections, 30% in America show more than one infection. So if you go to a doctor and they're just testing you for Lyme, or they're not testing you for Babesia, Bartonella, I'm not going to say uh, auricula, I can't say that, uh, mycoplasma pneumonia. Um, and you can see some other ones here, and I apologize, I can't see that part of my screen on the bottom. Um, but most most of us who have actually been diagnosed with Lyme disease have never tested for co-infections, which lead to those chronic symptoms because we may have cleared the Lyme bacteria, but we have not cleared the other bacteria. I know for me, I walked around for years, maybe decades with mycoplasma pneumonia, which is an infection in my lungs or what some people call walking pneumonia. And I always felt myself out of breath and I had issues. I had issues with my heart. I had issues with body tremors. Uh, and those were from co-infections that I was never actually tested for. So if we look at tick-borne infections, um, they're zoonotic, meaning they're passed from animals to human or vectors. Ticks, mosquitoes, fleas, um, they can transmit the disease to mice, rats, and squirrels that can bite humans. Um, they can carry bacteria, they can carry virus fungi, uh, protozoans, all at the same time, and they can transmit those through one bite. So if you do pull a tick off you, in America, there are plenty of places that will test the tick for certain um, infections. I recommend that anytime if you pull a tick, you want to pull it carefully with some clean tweezers. Be careful that you don't squeeze it because you could enable it to push more infection into your body. Oftentimes they say it has to be attached for a certain amount of time. I can tell you it, it can be attached for a few seconds. Um, one of the analogies is it's like stepping on a dirty needle. It can be instant. It can transfer a lot of unhealthy, nasty things. So if you see the tick, which most of us don't because they are so tiny, um, but if you do see one or have one, I do recommend having it tested. Um, maybe Peter can share later if there are any testing facilities in Australia, um, but specifically in Pennsylvania, we have four or five just because we are the largest um, case of infection. So there's a lot of studies here. Um, so most uh, common tick-borne disease in the U.S. is Lyme disease, Babesia, anaplasmosia, auriculiosis, I can never say that, relapsing fever, tel 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 teleremia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and um, some of these can cause minor issues. Some people can have these and, and their immune systems are strong enough that they might not show symptoms for a year. Some of these like alpha-gal or some of the other ones could cause uh, anaphylactic or immediate issues or, or even death. So it is, it is a very serious um, thing if you do find a tick because um, we never know what diseases they are carrying. Uh, Co-infections are infections that come together. Um, there's been studies that out of 3,000, over 50% have uh, co-infections and 30% or more have had two co-infections. So again, um, if you are battling uh, you know, or have had a tick bite, even in Australia, they can al also carry more than one. So you want to make sure that whatever doctor you're seeing is, is testing for these, these other uh, infections, virus, uh, fungi as well. One of the good resources here on LymeDisease.org is you can see the pathogen. Now it is US based, but um, if you've traveled to the US and you've gotten bit by a tick or you're doing travel, this is really helpful to know as well. 
So it talks about like alpha-gal, it becomes an allergy to the sugar molecule found in red meat. So some people can develop a meat allergy and it's not only looking at the meat you eat, but also some of the supplements um, may have meat in them. So you have to be careful of your medications as well as your food. So then it talks about what ticks um, or vector can carry that and also symptoms. So um, this is on the LymeDisease.org. Uh, and I won't go through all these, but you guys can check those out. So as most of you probably know, Lyme is considered the great imitator. There's over 150 common um, symptoms and diseases. So it does take a, a skilled practitioner to see which symptoms are um, Lyme disease or not. Um, Dr. Horowitz has an MSIDS, a Multiple Systemic Infectious Disease Syndrome questionnaire. Um, the doctor that uh, Jill and I both see, uh, his name is Dr. Conan Shaw. Um, I believe he said like 90, 90 or 95% of his patients that took that questionnaire that showed, showed, yes, you probably have multiple infectious disease. It was accurate. Um, so you can go on there. Um, Dr. Horowitz has a book um, called How Can I Get Better and Why Can't I Get Better? Uh, and he's based out of New York in the United States and, and is always doing research uh, for Lyme disease. So some of the misdiagnosed uh, or um, diseases that it mimics is ALS, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, lupus, Alzheimer's, rheumatoid arthritis, TMJ, uh, ADHD, PANS and PANDAS, which is a neurological issue that stems from issues with your kidneys and uh, strep, uh, anxiety, depression, psychiatric illness. So there are a lot of people that are being misdiagnosed uh, when it's really Lyme disease or other uh, co-infections. A thing to note here, Lyme disease patients with persistent in symptoms, there are blood work that you can do specifically. So the CBC, um, complete blood count, metabolic panel, thyroid testing, um, said rate, C-reactive protein, those can help rule out some of the other symptoms. Um, you want to look for severe anemia, liver, kidney, metabolic conditions such as diabetes, other inflammatory or neoplastic conditions. So there are different things if you can get a doctor that's on your side. And I always recommend people that if you ask your medical doctor to test for something and they refuse, ask them to document that in your medical chart. That often gets them to change their mind on helping you test because they have sworn an oath to do no harm. Um, I'm not sure of the technical terms in Australia, but in America, that's what they swear to do. And if they're not treating you or not listening to you, when you ask them to document that in your medical records, which follows you, oftentimes they change and, and want to support you. And then I always tell my clients, if your doctors are not supporting you, find a new one. You don't owe them anything. You can go get another doctor and another doctor and another doctor until you find one that supports you. So here's an image from the National Institute of Health. And again, another great resource for those of you that are looking, you know, if you like the research and you like the data for Lyme disease. Um, so PTLDS is also chronic Lyme. It's post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. So it's after that initial 14 days or after when your doctor thinks that they've done enough treatment, it shows what's left. Fatigue, joint pain, focus, concentration, muscle pain finding words. Uh, I still struggle with that sometimes. Sometimes my mouth and my brain don't work at the same time. So if that happens tonight, it's just this something that happens. Um, sleep, neck pain, um, issues with your hands and feet, irritability, low back pain, headaches. The list goes on. I won't go through all of that. But um, you can see that there are so many that, you know, we'll get into the genetic part of it. But you know, these are not normal. This is, these are symptoms that your body is telling you you're still fighting an infection or you're still fighting a bacteria, or there's still something that your body needs to process out, to get out, to cure, I guess, if you want to use that word. Um, so again, always tracking your symptoms, whether you have a journal, you want to use an app on your phone, um, just something to see is, okay, is the fatigue brought on by a food? Is it brought on by environment or stress? Or, you know, if you've had a certain time after treatment, and then you'll have some really good data to look at and to share with your medical team. 
So I started to talk about the rash earlier and in 2014, although that's 10 years ago already, but that's how far the data is behind. Um, Lorraine Johnson uh, posted that those that had an EM rash was 27 to 80%, which seems staggering that it could be that different, but is that different because it varies by state? So with us having 51 states, everybody has all this different data. However, most people don't get a rash and there are a lot of factors to that. Some is because their bodies are not healthy enough to produce that rash. Um, I never had a rash. Now I had ringworm as a child that now I wonder if that wasn't actually a rash, but we had a swimming pool and lived on three acres. So they thought maybe it was that. Um, I had some health symptoms, uh, you know, in my younger years that very well could have been Lyme disease as a child. Um, I've always lived in Western Pennsylvania my whole life and, and been outside as a photographer, as a Girl Scout, always camped. Um, but I, I never had a rash until my second Lyme infection. I started gardening uh, as part of my art therapy project, and I had a rash that was um, five inches in diameter on my back. I, I felt it felt funny. I was having a little bit of symptoms, um, but I had asked my husband to look because something didn't feel right. And he was like, oh, wow, there's there's something on your back. Um, and then I knew I knew what it was. I knew the symptoms that I kind of been putting off. Um, and I went to MedExpress and they started me on some some medication. Um, and, you know, that path continued for a while. Um, but I can share with you those of you that get a rash or you may have something that doesn't look like a bullseye. And if you have darker skin, um, you, you it may look very different. So there are a lot of studies in the United States on different what the rash could look like. Uh, and the Lyme disease.org is really good, especially with this study that it may not look like a bullseye of what you think that might look like. It might look like a rash. It might be small. It might be huge. It might be on different parts of your body. Uh, so, you know, it's not always a, if you have a rash, you have Lyme. It's very possible that you just might not have it or it might not look like the typical one. So again, that's when you listen to your body and advocate for yourself. So if Lyme disease is not treated early, uh, it can it can spread, it can hide, it can find a, a create a jelly-like substance called a biofilm to protect itself. So weeks, months, years later, some people develop problems in their brain, in their nervous system, their muscles, their heart, circulation. They have nightmares, reproductive issues, hormone issues. So, I mean, it is a very... Uh, difficult disease, uh, a very excruciating. Uh, I'm in line groups with probably 200,000 people. We all have different symptoms. We all have different treatment paths. Um, but I can tell you when, when you're in the thick of it, it's very difficult, um, often lonely. Most of the time it's not discussed that the number one actually will say killer from Lyme disease is suicide. And some of that is because people feel alone. Some of that is because the bacteria can cross that blood brain barrier and get into your brain. So it is a very difficult disease, but I can share with you, there's hope. Um, I am I am thriving, I'm advocating, I, I'm here with all of you. So, um, you know, we'll talk about different ways I can help support you, but um, know that if it is something that you're dealing with, um, you know, there are, there are people out there that will, will help you and will support you. Um, so there's no statistics in the U.S. on how many people actually have chronic Lyme or post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Um, the average guess about 20%. I will tell you from the Lyme disease groups I'm in, it's, it's way more than that. Um, and we'll, we'll get into some, some things I think that can, can help through that. So a little bit more about the statistics in here of um, impact on communities. Uh, studies in the United States show that it's it's higher in men. However, they've realized that the studies are skewed because they're asking more men than they are women. So more um, cases are children um, and more prolonged symptoms are actually in women in the studies. Um, and I would say the line groups that I'm in, it's probably 90% women, if not 95% women. Um, and I do believe there's an extra hormonal piece to that, an environmental piece to that, some toxins and makeup and different things that we'll kind of talk through. Um, there's some different studies here that show that children with Lyme disease, their IQ can have a 22 point drop. 
Um, a lot of times um, children are misdiagnosed and put on the autism spectrum where it's sometimes Lyme disease or undiagnosed Lyme disease. So there are you know, different research and study. Columbia University does some great studies. Uh, there's some links here. Again, I'll share all these with you if you you know, if you have a child who's having some issues and you're concerned it's Lyme disease or, you know, if you'd like to, to get into the research of it. Um, so as I stated earlier, I'm in Pennsylvania. Um, we are a leading Lyme. We are the hot spots. Although it started in Lyme, Connecticut, Pennsylvania is a high state, Michigan's a high state, Connecticut's a high, high state, New York. Um, so again, there's, you know, calls for it to be recognized in um, in Australia, and, and some some of it's being heard, some of it's not. Um, there's a link on here um, that again I'll share with you. There's a, a young man on YouTube that's advocating, and you know, bless him for for trying to to share this information and speak out. Um, even the the Lyme Disease.org in America, you know, they talk about the Australian patients in Lyme disease. So we we see you there. We see that it's a struggle here, and we see that it's a struggle there as well. So some additional symptoms and, and everybody that I speak with and that I talk to and in the groups, uh, they present different. Their co-infections are different. Um, I was very fortunate to have had Epstein-Barr, I had mycoplasma pneumonia, but I, I never had the, you know, the Bartonella or, you know, the Rocky Mountain spotted fever, some of those really uh, detrimental issues. Uh, I was fortunate um, not to have that, but we test the ticks in our area and four of the five ticks that we've had just in the last year have carried the Lyme bacteria. So Bell's palsy, um, which is the facial paralysis. Um, I look nice and thin, but if I smile, I, I lost a lot of some muscle capacity in, in the side of my face um, from the Bell's palsy that I had. And I hope someday that'll get better, but it's just part of me now. Um, neck pain. I think I can't, I, I would not live without my chiropractor. I had a lot of difficulty with neck pain, um, ended up being diagnosed with cervical cranial instability. Some of that from a car accident, some of that from amino acid deficiency, um, some of that from Lyme disease, because it does, uh, take your collagen, which weakens your system. Um, I was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos hypermobile, so there's so many things that, it, you know, each person is going to present differently. Um, headaches are very common, photophobia or light sensitivity. Uh, Epstein-Barr is very common in people with Lyme disease. It's very common in most of us in the United States. Um, but whether you're showing symptoms or not always depends. Neuropathies, anemia, um, vitamin, mineral deficiencies. There's so many additional symptoms that, you know, again, you want to journal and track. <coughs> Excuse me. So the global LimeAlliance.org, I am a volunteer for them as well. Uh, they have a Lyme symptom and tracker app that you can download for free. And then we can track your symptoms and share those with your doctor. Um, and they are a global Lyme Alliance. So they are trying to help globally. Um, uh, they have a fantastic Instagram. Um, I, I follow them on Facebook, but I tend to see more of their posts on Instagram. So we're gonna get almost to the best part with the genetic part. Um, but this slide here, you know, often missed by the medical team is uh, genetic immune and detox issues, which we're gonna go into. Um, not testing for co-infections, toxins, mold, heavy metals, and parasites. Not accounting for the biofilm, which is the jelly-like substance that forms around the pathogen. So that's a protector. Um, Overlooking crossing the blood brain barrier, oftentimes those symptoms like ALS or tremors, they're not looking at it being from Lyme disease, they're looking at it from another perspective. Um, and then the die off the die off can cause neurotoxins in the body, which cause uh, it's called a Herxmeyer reaction. It's named after um, the gentleman who discovered that. So sometimes we get worse with treatment, um, and that is because the neurotoxins are floating around in our body. And sometimes we have a hard time flushing those out. And there is a genetic component to that that I will discuss here shortly. Uh, nutrition, vitamin, minerals, amino acids, antioxidants, 
Uh, those are all used in holistic approaches in recovery. So, uh, you know, often people with Lyme have issues with parasites. Parasites like to steal your minerals. So if you're not supplementing with minerals, whether you're getting it through your food, tincture or supplement, then, you know, you continue to, to have these chronic symptoms. So through self-decode, I can not only analyze genetics, I can also run lab work. Um, so we look at the Lyme IgG, Lyme IgM, the CD57. So in the United States, the ILADS, um, they do recognize the CD57 as a way to look at uh, Lyme disease to see how long that you have actually been fighting that infection, to see how long your body has been producing that response. Um, there's other testing, uh, the C3A, you can look at the C34. So there are other testing that is available to see, you know, how long your body's been fighting or what your body's been fighting. But I often tell people that, you know, testing is good. However, your blood's changing, your body's changing, your symptoms changing. So if you have access and you have insurance and you can do the testing, that's great. Um, but otherwise, you know, listen to your body and, you know, start, start a treatment path. So I'm going to take just a minute to get a drink of water, and then we're going to go into um, the role of genetics here. And I know that there'll be some questions there. So again, you can either hold them towards the end or shoot them in the, in the chat to Barb. And if those of you also have water, that is also key. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna show a little video. Your health, diseases and the environment. Many common diseases are complex, which means they are influenced by a great number of different genes, different mutations and the environment. While your genes might make you more likely to have some conditions over others, your environment also plays a huge role in determining the actual diseases or conditions you end up with. Imagine you have a jar of marbles. Everyone is born with a different amount of genetic predispositions to certain disorders, like a predisposition to anxiety. As we live our lives, we also experience environmental factors or stresses that influence our mental health. Once the jar is full, we start to show signs of the condition, such as by having an anxiety disorder. Sometimes, with more of a predisposition to an anxiety disorder, it may require less stresses to show the signs of the condition, and vice versa. This is what we focus on in self decode we use advanced algorithms and machine learning to understand how the changes in your genes play a role in your predispositions to complex genetic conditions. And then we look into recommendations that are more likely to work for you based on your genetics. Our goal is to help you implement changes that are tailored to your body and designed to help you reach optimal health. So before I explain this, I'll share a little bit about my journey. Um, my first genetic testing experience, I was pregnant with my son and my husband's sister had passed away from cystic fibrosis, which is a terminal illness. Um, she lived till she was 24, but most children don't live that long. Um, but my insurance wouldn't cover me to have testing prior to being pregnant because there was no family history. But once I was pregnant, they offered me genetic testing, but I chose not to have that just because of the inadequate testing at that time. Um, and I, um, due to different beliefs, I, I did not want, I did not want to know I would love my child regardless. Um, but once I was diagnosed with Lyme and my neurologist thought that some of my issues were Ehlers-Danlos, I went to see a genetic specialist at the Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh because despite Pittsburgh having millions of people, we didn't have access to a genetic counselor. And they ran a limited amount of tests because my insurance didn't want to pay for it. Um, and I was told that I had some variants that they didn't understand. And I was handed a script for pain medication, which I knew from my whole life that I did not do well with pharmaceuticals or medication. Um, I had my first surgery at age seven. I had my fifth and sixth surgery by the time I was out of high school. 
I had my gallbladder removed in my 20s. So I, I, I've always had a rough go with medications and surgeries and doctors. So I, I knew there was something else. I didn't, I, I didn't, I, I was a little scared with genetics and I, I share some of that on my, my Facebook and some of my blogs, but um, I also looked, knew there was root cause. I knew there was something else going on. So um, I found a book uh, by Dr. Ben Lynch called Dirty Genes, and it, it really changed my perspective on genetics as well as epigenetics. So epigenetics are your gene expression. So your genes, some genes are never going to change, but some can turn on and off, which shows you know, from different things, your environment, uh, you know, they showed a little bit of that in the video. So there are genetic factors that can influence susceptibility and progression. So I'm going to talk about four here, and then I'm going to talk about four in some case studies. So what I found really interesting is that in the United States, for the past 40 years, they've um, had a study of something called pharmacogenetics. So that is how your body responds to medication. Now, if you've had a 23andMe in the past, they used to give you a pharmacogenetic report that told you exactly how these main um, genes worked in your liver and your kidneys to help metabolize medication. So I knew uh, in 2018 that doxycycline was not going to work for me because my liver did not metabolize it correctly. They also learned that all of the medication they had me on for reflux disease before they took my gallbladder out was processing too quickly through my body because of some liver issue, or I'm sorry, some kidney issues. So due to the sequencing of the human genome brought an understanding of pharmacogenetics on how people metabolize drugs. So if you get paperwork uh, with your medication, it tells in there your risk, whether you may have issues, what to go look for. And that is through this study. Um, so they can identify patients um, who are responsive or non-responsive to medication, develop interaction, or I'm sorry, <clears throat> develop interactions or maybe need a higher dose. So I don't believe you can get that under 23andMe anymore. I know that's something that self-decode we cannot give. Um, the FDA does not allow us in America to provide that information. I believe that's a travesty uh, on different levels that if your doctor is putting you on medication and does not know how your body's going to respond, I think that's doing a, a disservice. Uh, but if you've had medications that you're having issues with, you want to make sure you're tracking and noting that because it very well could be one of these gene issues causing that. So that is something that we can look at in self-decode on, on a gene level, but we can't provide a report just because the government does not allow us to provide that report. Uh, immune response. So gene mutations can impact your immune function, whether that's from limiting or preventing the development of specific immune cells. Um, mutations can lead to increased susceptibility or risk. So some of the reports that I can do are risk analysis to tell you whether you are, you know, at higher risk for cancers, or if you are, um, I like the biohacker reports specifically, um, because it can tell you if you have some environmental sensitivities that your doctors are not looking at. And um, uh, Barb did send me that. Um, Barbara O oh had asked about um, connection with mold. Uh, that was something that was big for me and big for most, and I'll go into more of that. But that is something that the biohacker report, you know, I was able to see that one of my top risks from environmental factors was mold. So mold illness is not a mold allergy, but I have an allergy to mold, but I also have a sensitivity issue to the mycotoxins from the mold, meaning that my body cannot clear it and it adds to my inflammation, which just is another burden to my body when it's trying to heal. So these are, you know, there's so many different reports out there and, you know, so many different companies now that you know, we can look at these things that are influencing your gene expression. And there's some really great studies out there on identical twins that they have the same genes, but they live different places or they eat different things. Um, there's a new documentary on Netflix that's, it's interesting. Some of it I agree with, some of it I don't agree with, but, um, you know, that's how we can see if people that are twins you know, they have all these different factors turning on and off or expressing or not expressing the genes. 
One of the other things that I really look at is sensitivity. So diet plans are great, um, but they focus on controlling the amount of macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Um, but depending on your body, you may not have the right enzymes to break those down, or you may have food sensitivities that are very, um, they're, they're not common. So, you know, gluten is talked about, dairy's talked about, but I'll go into more detail on oxalates and salicylates. So there are other things that, you know, you, you may be on a healthy diet, but it might not be the wrong specifically for you and your genes. Um, so it, as a functional nutrition expert, you know, I can really look into, you know, what is it they're eating? Is that something that's causing inflammation in your body or just another factor that maybe is keeping you, you know, from allowing your body to heal from the line because it's too overloaded with inflammation. So epigenetics, again, some people are uh, predisposed to higher, you know, levels of environmental toxins and whether that's heavy metals or it's mold or it's BPA, those are things that we can look at. And again, if your, if your body is just overloaded, you know, your, your immune system is not going to function right, or maybe the medication's not going to work right because there's all these extra factors that you're know, not being tested for or not being factored in. And that could put you at risk for, you know, heavy metal toxicity, mold exposure, or CIRS, SEERS, which is chronic inflammatory response, uh, or mast cell activation syndrome, or MCAS. Uh, those are all different things that are, you know, can be caused by your environment that could be adding to that chronic Lyme. So a little bit about pharmacogenetics, um, specifically for Lyme disease patients the ABCB1 gene. Uh, and those of you that have your genes, um, I know 23andMe has a search function. I'm not sure if Ancestry has a search function, but this is something that you could look up on your own, or it's something that we always look at uh, through the self-decode reporting. So sometimes it's called MDR1 uh, for multi-drug resistant gene. So this is to remove the xenobiotics from your body. So most chronic Lyme patients have this gene deficiency. So, oops, didn't mean to go there. So that means that you may be treating it, but this bacteria is still lingering through your body. So you may need to have some alternative things to help get that out, whether that's an infrared sauna, that's red light therapy, that's doing some things to help you sweat, if that's increasing your water or increasing your food, so you're having more um, bowel movement. So sometimes that bacteria is being killed, but it's just circulating through our system, causing those chronic symptoms. Uh, and then going back to the DOXY study, pharmacogenetics. So if you're not able to metabolize those medications, you know, I, I wonder, I only speculate is, is that why it's only 60 some percent effective? You know, are those other 40% just not able to break down the medication or is it just not enough medication? And those are research areas that I'm focused on and that I hope to present uh, in some future studies. So knowing how your body metabolizes medication, I think is key because if you're put on a medication that your body cannot break down, you know, you're going to take longer to heal or you maybe maybe you need like me herbal treatments or alternative therapies like an infrared sauna or the ion foot cleanses. So there, this is, a, I think, a key thing for me. But again, it's it's controversial. It's not being shared. Um, we can do the legwork and look at these things manually, but I cannot provide you a specific report um, because, the you know, the federal government here doesn't doesn't allow me to do that. Immune response, and this is from um, self-decode when we look at chronic Lyme disease. So TLR, which is toll-like receptors, um, mainly found in bacteria, viral, and fungal. Um, so once activated, they cascade and produce cytokines and other inflammatories to combat infection. Um, this is one of the areas where a lot of the studies and conversations now are long haulers from COVID being similar to Lyme disease. And this is part of that, uh, is that cytokine uh, area and inflammation. 
Um, I won't go too much into that. I'm still banned on some social media sites from talking about that. So I will, I will keep that conversation for another day. Um, but this is one of the things that we can look at um, for our Lyme disease patients through self-decode is to see, okay, are we having a hard time with the cytokines and inflammation? And then what are some other things we can do? And you know, those are things like the infrared sauna. That was a, a huge thing for me. I, I, I did not have the, in a, I had the, I couldn't sweat, um, but being in an infrared, infrared sauna, 140 degrees for 40 minutes, I was able to sweat, actually get some of that inflammation down and actually get some of that bacteria out of my body. One of the big things that our functional doctors look at um, is HLA, DRB1. Um, that is often in people that are not showing positive on testing. A lot of people that go to standard testing here in America are not testing positive for Lyme because they have this HLA issue. Um, you know, in the, it's, it's a receptor found on the surface of the white blood cell to flag and remove the harmful agents. So some of us, you know, our bodies are not responding to say, hey, this Lyme bacteria is bad for us. So we may in fact be positive, but not showing positive. Sensitivities, this is a big one that I think is often missed. Um, food intolerance uh, versus food sensitivity. So a food sensitivity is not a result of an allergic reaction, um, but rather, uh, your immune system it, it producing a response to things that it's unable to break down. Uh, and I'm going to go more specifically into that. Uh, I think that's a huge component that's often missed in, in chronic Lyme. Um, the same with the en environment sensitivity. So we know that there are certain things in our area that's bad for us. Um, you know, the, the carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, um, the volatile organic compounds often in, in, in new furnitures and in paints, um, heavy metals. We know that those are linked to birth defects, heart disease, um, and toxicity can, and can reduce life expectancy. So uh, through genetics, we can look at, you know, do you have issues with these environmental pieces that, you know, maybe if you pull out some of these toxicities, then your body can actually start to heal from the Lyme heal from that bacteria. So it's often said that it's like peeling an onion that you have to start on the outside, you know, looking at viral overload, looking at toxins, looking at parasites. So again, it's those pieces where it's often overlooked for people with Lyme diseases, you know, their doctors aren't looking at these other factors that could be just weighing down your body. Methylation, this is the big one. Um, and now Dr. Ben Lich, he talks a lot about MTHFR. I will say in my experience, it is not the end all be all in methylation. The, there's a whole methylation system. A lot of doctors in America are just looking at the MTHFR and not looking at the rest of the pathway. So I'll share a little bit more about that. Um, but these can help turn on and off your genes in that epigenetics. So the pathways convert homocysteine, methanion using folate. So it involves processes in sulfur, amino acids. I mean, it really is, um, you know, how your system is, is, is ran. And, you know, there's some different reports that talk about it, like thinking like the gas and the oil of your car and, you know, you have to have clean gas and clean oil for things to work right. So there's some different analogies out there, but, you know, methylation is key. Uh, and I'll, I'll share more about that in a minute. Uh, and then again, the epigenetics, so environment, lifestyle, diet, those are all things that can turn on and off your genes. Um, the pattern of methylation and demethylation can impact your health, your aging, chronic disease, uh, as well as cancer. So, you know, there's a huge, huge discussion in the Lyme groups of so many people that have the MTHFR and, you know, they look at two genes, but at Self-Decode, we look at thousands upon thousands of genes. And then through Dr. Ben Lynch's work and strat gene, we look at, you know, different pathways and how they all work together. And again, I'll share more about that here. I'm going to get some water. Okay, so case studies. So these are from some patients, clients of mine, some are my own personal. Um, 
I would ask that you can take notes, but don't share these um, because they are proprietary information um, from self-decode. Um, but they are very, very useful. And these are you know samples of some of the reports. So currently I have 15 um, genetic clients uh, that I've been using for, for research and data. And 14 of 15 of them are suspected Lyme. 14 of 15 of them have a chronic illness. So most of the clients that I have are coming to me because they have a chronic illness and they're really struggling to get answers, to find answers. Uh, and they've also dealt with Lyme disease. So the gene that I spoke about earlier, the ABCB1, about the drug resistance, 93% um, of my clients have that gene deficiency, showing that they're more susceptible to chronic Lyme because their body is just really struggling um, from that genetic piece. 87% uh, of these clients of mine have two or more methylation issues. So again, it's not just the MTHFR. There's PEMT, which affects your choline. Um, there's the CBS that's also um, prevalent in estrogen issues in um, the MTRR, which depends on you know, how you handle heavy metals. So this methylation is a key thing. And a lot of them are, you know, these environmental factors or these food or these vitamin or mineral deficiencies like B12, B9 um, that have cofactors of B2 and B6. So having a multivitamin is great, but you also want to have a multivitamin that you can make, break down. So for me, I was put on a B complex um, that gave me headaches. Um, you know, I remember stopping treatment because I, I really felt like um, I just I just couldn't do it. It was really, really hurting my body on, on every level. Uh, and then a few years later, I realized that, you know, I had some issues in my methylation genes that required me to have a methyl free B vitamin. So I could not use um, a methyl B vitamin. My body could not break it down and it was just building up as a toxin. One of the things Unfortunately, in America, a lot of our food is filled with folic acid. A lot of our supplements have folic acid, which is a man-made form of folate or folinic acid. So for me, I have to get my B vitamins through food, but I also have to be careful of what food. So leafy greens are really good for, for B vitamins, but I have an oxalate sensitivity, so I don't break down spinach but I can use arugula. So I really had to fine tune my nutrition, my diet, my supplements to how my body could break it down. But I, I get credit that to why I'm able to speak to you today uh, because I really use that genetic information to fine tune my treatment plans. Food sensitivity. So 73% of my 15 clients have a food sensitivity that's not tested by conventional testing. Uh, oxalates, salicylates, so a little bit about oxalates, I'll go, I'll go into that in a moment, but um, it, these are in plants, same with salicylate, salicylates. Um, those are also found in some, some pain creams as well. So you know, sometimes it's things not only we're putting in our body, but we're putting on our body that could be adding to our toxic burden and causing us, you know, these issues. And then mold, and, and again, I, I saw that um, Barbara had asked about this, 60% of my 15 clients have an inability to clear airborne mold. Now, I'm not sure of the statistics in Australia, but in America, 50% of homes have mold uh, from whether it's water damage or it's because of the season, maybe it can't dry out. Sometimes it's poor uh, workmanship in buildings. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of schools have flat roofs because it's cheaper um, and because of how they build them. But if they get a a water that's setting on there, that's going to go through the roof. That's going to go through, you know, my son, for example, he was on the first floor of a, an older school building and they had a leak and he come home and he said, he was in first grade and he said, mom, there's a leak. It's so bad. So I contacted the teacher and she said, I've been trying to get them to do something. And I said, well, we've already experienced mold. There's got to be something going on. And they had carpet. The leak was in their room with all the papers um, come to find out there were six first graders that were sick. First graders that were being put on anxiety medication, putting on all this medication when it was the mold in the school. Now, if you are in America, 
you have renter's rights. So if you are renting and there's mold in your home, you do have rights to make sure that you're living in a safe home. If you suspect that you live uh, or your kids go to school with a building, um, you can file something called a right to know. Uh, unfortunately, that's the path. The superintendent would not tell me about mold testing. I had to file through the state and go through their attorneys. But I did find that people were complaining about the mold. I found that teachers were getting sick. Um, I ended up pulling my son out and homeschooling him, and he has not been sick since. But um, sick building syndrome is a thing. Dr. Richie Shoemaker has been studying it since the 80s. Um, but there's no regulation on mold in America. I'm sure it's probably similar in Australia. Um, but again, those are things you can advocate for. There are people like myself that have been sick from it, that are sharing our stories, that are sharing that information. So, you know, it's and it's not an allergy to mold. This is a sensitivity, meaning that, you know, it's causing some more inflammation in your body. So they do go hand in hand, unfortunately. Um, and I think over time from the, the breakdown and genetics and, and different things and, um, you know, from generations, but, you know, 60% of my clients do have issues with mold. Um, and then they start testing and they find out maybe there's some in their home or maybe some in their workplace. And then once they're able to pull that mold and inflammation down, you know, then they start testing positive for Lyme or they start getting, feeling better, you know, with their treatment. So, you know, it is like the, the, the video showed earlier is that, you know, all of these things adding into your inflammatory load or your bucket, so to speak, you know, can cause, you know, a slow slowering of, you know, your healing and your healing process. So this is a case study here for uh, risk factors and um, genetics for chronic Lyme. So we look at the T LR, we look at the ABCB1, the HLA, uh, and, and some other genes here. So how self-decode works for reporting is if it's red, that means it's a double mutation. Um, and that could either be from you inherited one from each of your parents or one of your parents has a double mutation. And then if you see the yellow, um, that's either you get one bad copy, so to speak, from each of your parents, or, you know, if one has the high risk and one has the low risk, it evens out to be in that middle area. And then green is showing that you don't have any issues, you know, inherited from, from your genetic line. So it's a risk for developing Lyme disease. Um, it can, you know, obviously our reference here is based on a tick location, time spent outdoors, you know, the season. So genetics doesn't play a factor in role of susceptibility to Lyme disease. However, in some people, including myself, um, this report is actually from my son, um, that you can have those cross post chronic Lyme disease uh, from, from treatment. So, you know, the immune response, the inflammation, the removal of the bacteria. So for, for us, you know, the, the variant were more likely to suffer from chronic Lyme after having that Borrelia infection. Um, and I will say that it has been true for, for myself and my son, uh, both having some lingering symptoms afterwards. So oftentimes there are other genetic risks that if you get one, you get the other. Um, so when you see these reports on here, you know, because it is data, because it is risk analysis, you know, there's some different reports that say, take this as a grain of salt, it's for educational purposes. However, I can tell you these reports are exactly what my son and I went through. Um, but we were able to, again, take this information, you know, work on our treatment path, whether we needed more medication or a different medication or alternative treatments to help flush that bacteria out. Um, I didn't realize I was chronically dehydrated. You know, they say uh, in my functional nutrition training, half of your body weight in ounces. So let's just say you're a hundred pounds. You should have 50 ounces of water uh, a day to help flush things out. So for me, I needed a little bit more than that to help flush the bacteria out. Um, and due to some other issues and food issues and sensitivities, I didn't know it wasn't having regular bowel movement. So that was again, just recirculating those bacteria. So focusing on your nutrition, focusing on your hydration, focusing on your bowel movements, your sweating. Those are different things that if you do have this gene where your body's more likely to hold on to some of these bacterias or this inflammation, those are gonna make a big difference for you.
So when we look at methylation in through self-decode, we look at MTHFR, we look at MTRR, CBS, PEMT, and there's some other ones here. So again, if you have access to your raw data or you know the 23andMe where you can look these up, um, these are really big influences in chronic Lyme disease. Uh, I see it in my patients, I see it in myself. Um, so that the MTHFR, again, it, it's, it comes up a lot. Um, it's common in neurological issues, cancers, diabetes, pregnancy complications. Um, I mean, Dr. Ben Lynch, you wrote a, you know, he, he writes books on it and he has a whole MTHFR.net. Uh, and that's where I found that I had a sensitivity to yellow five and yellow six. So I ended up having to pull that out of my diet to help my methylation system work. And I always knew, I, I thought I had an issue with dairy, but it turned out it was the yellow dye that was added into the cheese or the macaroni or, you know, those the certain processed foods that it was the food dye in it that was causing more of my issues with my methylation rather than, you know, the, the dairy or the lactose. And the MTHFR is, I'll share more in um, my clients um, statistically. However, the MTRR uh, is second, and that is, um, it's very complex uh, and uh, requires B12 and zinc. So a lot of us with chronic Lyme seem to be an issue with zinc, not only with the B12, but also with copper. And I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So heavy metal exposure Mercury, copper, lead, cadmium, um, nitric oxide from dental procedures, um, candida, oxidative stress, inflammation, chlorine, formaldehyde, a lot of things that are in products that you might be using every day, either in cleaners or your furniture. If you have this MTRR, that's going to cause issues in your methylation system um, that, again, is going to keep you from healing correctly. So that goes back to my earlier statement of, you know, if your doctors are not testing for these other things, you very well could have some type of heavy metal toxicity. Um, I can tell you that early gray hair is also linked to genetics, but if you have a copper zinc uh, dysregulation like I did, it could show up in your hair, um, having premature gray hair. So I actually worked with Wendy Myers Detox and had a, a hair mineral testing done um, to actually verify my copper and zinc deficiencies as well as my adrenal fatigue and um, uh, my metabolism issues. So there are other testing out there, hair mineral testing. You can do blood work to test for heavy metals, but that's just what's circulating in your blood at that moment where the hair is an accumulation of those items. So again, knowing these genes, you can help ask your doctors to rule these things out and to look or change your products. So for me, I no longer wear deodorant that has aluminum in it because it's getting stuck in my body, causing me these issues. So I use more of a natural deodorant. I use more natural cleaners um, to make sure I'm not getting exposure to those um, heavy metals because my body has a harder time um, getting them out. So the CVS gene, um, another one, I, I see it a lot in my clients. So it's the conversion of homocysteine to a lot of things. I'm not going to read the words because I'm going to say them all incorrectly. Um, but it involves V6 as well as uh, HEMI as a cofactor, which is iron. Uh, so we see a lot of these vitamin and mineral deficiencies here that um, pathogens can steal your iron. So if you're having this issue here, it's linked to a lot of um, hormonal issues as well. Um, so if you, if you, if your doctor and your insurance will cover it, you know, I always recommend having some vitamin and mineral testing done to see if you're having some deficiencies because these genes might be allowing these bacteria that, you know, it, cause if it's not just Lyme, if it's those other bacterias or viruses, or parasites, they could be stealing your nutrients. So you might be taking a multivitamin, but you might not be absorbing it, or you it might be stolen, so to speak, from, from parasites or something else you're dealing with. 
Uh, and there's some home treatments you can do for parasites. There's groups all over the internet. Um, I caution you to do them. If you do them, do them carefully, do them with no doctor's going to supervise you on it, but you want to be careful because you can, you know, if you're killing them, you know, they could be trying to do some damage on the way out. Um, I personally did hydrocolon therapy um, to help retrain my bowels, but also to remove some parasites. And then when I treated my mold, I had uh, binders um, with activated charcoal and some other things that actually kind of cut up the parasites and expel those with them. So there are some natural and healthy supplements and, and other ways that you can do for, for parasite cleanses. Uh, PEMT, which is choline, I see that a lot in my clients as well. Um, and that is bioflow, liver. A lot of people that have had their gallbladder removed often have a PEMT gene deficiency. Um, because we're not getting enough choline um, to help with that bile. And that also affects the estrogen receptors as well. So if you're having some hormone issues, or depending on where you're holding your weight, oftentimes those are linked to some genetic issues that you can take a supplement or add some food. So for me, I just eat sunflower seeds to get the salicylcholine to help uh, choline through food. Um, I, I can create a custom supplement based on your genetics, but I, as a functional nutrition expert, try to get mine through food because it's easier to uh, break that down for me. So there are even different foods that you can incorporate in to help your methylation. So Dr. Ben Lynch's is book, Dirty Genes. If you don't have genetic testing, you can read his book and do a questionnaire and it's usually pretty spot on. And then he gives you recipe ideas and other things. And um, you know, I, I am an affiliate with them. I do have a discount code for that. If you wanna get his book or you wanna have your stuff ran through his strat gene reports, um, they are very sciencey and technical. Um, so I do some, work with clients for his reports, but self-decode for me was a lot easier to understand and, and they do work together. So um, Dr. Ben Lynch used to do genetic testing. They no longer do that. So self-decode, we can do genetic testing, get your raw data, and then you could further analyze that through StratGene if you wanna specifically look at your methylation pathways. Uh, but that is something through through my training and research over the years that I can, you know, if you say, hey, look, I have this, I can help you with different things to kind of pull out or add in. And I, and I truly believe this is this was what helped me get to where I'm at. And, you know, um, if you go on my Facebook page, you can see some of the videos of where I was at before. I mean, just a year ago, I, I had full body tremors um, all day long. I had a video reach half a million people on Facebook because I had such bad tremors you know, my whole body. Um, but I don't have those issues anymore because I was able to really focus on, you know, how my body was built on a genetic level. So this case study is on nutrition uh, sensitivity. So gluten, you know, in America, gluten is um, toxic. Um, there's uh, phosphates, you know, there's there's cancer proven from, from Roundup, from the treatments that are sprayed on our wheat. Um, however, if you look at a lot of labels, they're very um, misleading because it'll say gluten-free, but there shouldn't even be gluten in it. So, you know, sometimes it's really hard to distinguish, you know, what's gluten and what's gluten-free. Um, I know there's some people on here that haven't had gluten for years, and if they do it, they have an instant reaction. Um, there's celiac versus non-celiac disease for gluten. Um, but for me, and this is actually, this is actually my report here, um, and oxalate sensitivity. So oxalates can steal your calcium. They can um, mess with kidneys, kidney stones. So, you know, for me, I had this really awful diet, this sad American standard diet. Uh, I didn't know any better. Uh, and I worked too much and, uh, you know, had food out of a box rather than cooking it on my own. Uh, but once I saw my clinical nutritionist, you know, he said, you know, almonds, spinach, turned out that I was eliminating the bad things, right? I was taking the gluten out, I was taking the dairy out, but I was adding all these oxalates. So it was actually poisoning myself with all of these oxalates. And I started to see it. My husband started to see it. He's like, you think it's his nuts that you're eating? Do you think it's something you're eating? And and sure enough, we found that's what it was. So, you know, if, if doctors is just missing these pieces, then, you know, you could just be having this chronic inflammation and this chronic battle in your body um, 
that, you know, with genetic testing, you don't, you don't have to. So if you can see that your body doesn't have the enzymes to break down certain foods, then you can make different choices uh, of what you're eating. Now, the salicylate is interesting because it's in many over-the-counter pain creams, aspirins, pharmaceuticals um, that may have gluten in it and the salicylate. So you might be taking a pain cream because you have joint pain from your Lyme, but that pain cream might be adding to your inflammation or your toxic overload. So, you know, knowing these things about your genes to me is, you know, really fine-tuning your path to healing. So, you know, reading labels can be tricky, but you do want to, you know, read your labels um, to see, you know, what other things are in there. Um, one of the things I see a lot, uh, I'm pretty good at, um, I guess, asking questions to do with my experience, but, you know, sometimes even in the functional world, people are over supplemented. So if you have an issue with oxalates, having too much vitamin C is actually going to cause you pain and fatigue. So I, I really see that's why some people really thrive on the carnivore diet because they're eliminating the salicylates, they're eliminating the oxalates, they're eliminating the gluten because they're doing more meat than they are more plants. However, sometimes if you're over supplementing where you're doing an IV treatment and you feel worse, maybe you're getting too much vitamin C at one time, adding to that oxalate that's pulling your calcium, that's messing with your kidneys. So you know, knowing, you know, if you have histamine issues or lectin sensitivity, you know, you can really fine tune your nutrition to be what your body should have. And I do believe this is the future uh, it's in America. I'm not sure about Australia, um, but a lot of the, the health coaches that I work with and the doctors I've studied under, you know, we're really looking at that fine tune nutrition. Now, I'm not saying that you and your spouse and your kids should all have different meals because that's too much work for everybody. However, um, it, it's not about being a picky eater. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's a food sensitivity that your body's actually saying, Hey, I don't like this. So, um, you know, again, that's where you want to listen to your body. If whether you've had genetic testing or not, that if you're eating a certain food, you know, and you're instantly getting a stomach ache or you're getting irritable bowel or you're burping or you're farting, like those things are not normal. Those are your body telling you, Hey, look, something's going to change here. So I, again, food journaling, I use chronometer. And again, I'll share a link with that. Um, you can track your symptoms, you can track your food, you can look at your oxalate versus calcium. So sometimes it's not about just eliminating it, but it's about balancing it and, or lowering the amount. So uh, high oxalates are spinach, almonds, coffee, chocolate. So I love chocolate. I, I've, I've lowered it, um, but I can't completely get rid of it. And that's okay because I'm human and I'm not going to stress out about if I, I had a brownie. My son makes gluten-free brownies because he's 12 and, and that's part of his homeschooling is he likes to cook. So being stressed about it's going to cause more issues for my body than actually enjoying brownie once in a while. So, you know, but knowing, you know, the, the, the amount that you can have, or, you know, if I, I don't have any oxalates the rest of the day, but I have something with oxalates, it's not going to be as much of a burden to my body. So this is what a strategy report looks like. And it's fascinating and sometimes confusing, but um, Dr. Ben Lynch, I mean, he's, he's a brilliant doctor. Um, he's in Oregon in the United States. Um, his book, again, Dirty Genes, really changed my life. So this is what he looks at as the top seven. So this is mine. So I have a slow MTHFR. And if we look here, arsenic, lead, folic acid, that is going to slow my methylation. I have had lead poisoning. We don't know where I'm getting lead poisoning. I live near a nuclear power plant. I live near a, a, um, a shell cracker plant. Um, I live in an old home. So we're not sure where the lead poisoning is coming from. I do have some tattoos, so very possible from that. Um, so he tells you on his reports, what can speed it up, what can slow it down. Um, the calm T is very common for doctors to look at. So an infection can cause issues with that. Um, serotonin, folate, vitamin D, I can share vitamin D issues are very common in Lyme patients as well. Uh, in the United States, there's some controversy on vitamin D because it's actually a hormone. So supplementing it sometimes can cause issues. Um, 
but getting out in the sun is, you know, if you could go out once a day and get in the sun, if you could go out and get your feet in the grass, uh, you know, they, they call them tree huggers, but if you could literally hug a tree, you're going to get the energy from the tree and, and release some of that energy in your body. If grounding, if you put your feet in the ground and get the sun in your face. So, you know, there's some of these natural treatments that, you know, we can do to really help our body specifically this, you know, our methylation system. Uh, let's see here, the MAOA, um, inflammation, vitamin C, chronic stress. So I have to be careful of my vitamin C in a lot of different ways for my heart, for my kidneys. So knowing this, I, you know, I have to, it was always sensitive to supplements. I always knew that, but I didn't understand why. So now I know that, you know, a multivitamin is not the best for me. I know that certain powders are not the best for me that have a lot of vitamin C in it. Um, and this bottom one, glutathione is huge in a detox and supplement and mine is up and down in this copper, mercury, zinc, iron. That has been a, an ongoing issue for my body. I have a very fine line of what works for me in copper, um, and, and zinc, but that chronometer app can help me balance that with my food and with my supplements. So, you know, I, I think having all of these pieces for me really was beneficial to know that you know, this, this GSTO gene down here on the bottom, um, I am at more risk of mold issues from mold exposure. So I can see that in a lot of ways through my genetics and, you know, the, I'm the canary in the coal mine, so to speak. If I go into a store or a home, I could tell them immediately whether they, they may have an issue with mold or moisture. Um, that's just how sensitive my body is. Uh, I don't think I'll always be that way, um, but I am still still in, in healing from some things. Um, BPA plastics are really bad for me, so I can switch my products from plastics to glass. Um, I just started with a company in the U.S. that actually does go worldwide, even in Australia, called Melaleuca, where you know their their goal is to have healthy products that don't have all these toxins in it. So you know it, it is the time you know, worldwide that people are, you know, being open to, you know, just switching their products to lowering their toxins, but we can see on a genetic level and how important that is. So I'm going to share this slide here, um, current research, the study I talked about with doxycycline, this is the link here. And again, um, it'll be tomorrow for the Americans and on Saturday and then either Saturday evening or Sunday for those of you in Australia because of the time change that I'll send these links to everybody. Um, but you can read, you can look at the study on doxy. I, I know it's it's usually what's what's given. There's also amoxicillin, there's tetracycline, there's you know dapsin treatment that they're looking at. But this study is really helpful to know that you know if you're prescribed this, it, it might not be the right thing for you or genetically you might need more or less. Um, there's alternative treatments like infrared sauna, the Rife machine, the ion foot cleanse, red light therapy. Um, I don't have on here, but acupuncture, chiropractor, you know, a lot of times we miss treating our body. We might add supplements or food, but our body needs help. Our body needs work, you know, because these, these bacteria, they get sucked in or they, they hide. Um, this is an Amazon link here. Um, this is great reviews. Most of these are in supplements that I have taken personally. And in a lot of the Lyme groups, people are raving about this product. Again, the disclaimer, look at it. Don't make changes without talking to your medical provider. Um, but this tick immune support, uh, is a lot of, um, so Japanese, not wood, cat's claw. You can get cat's claw in a tea, um, Chinese skull cap. Cryptolipus, I believe that helps with clearing the bacteria. Uh, so the supplements in here, uh, I mean, there's almost five-star reviews with 302 and you can get it on Amazon, uh, but it's big in the Lyme groups that I'm in. Most of these supplements are something that has been in the treatment protocols because I've had eight different protocols in the last five years. Um, so there are others natural. So if you can't handle the doxy or you can't handle the treatments, there are a lot of really good supplements out there. Uh, but again, when you start something, you want to journal, see if you're having any adverse reactions. Um, and then that way you can decide, you know, if it's going to work for you or not. Uh, this one here, and then I think we're going to get into questions. Um, 
So this is from functional genomics. So I, you know, with my clients, they send me their other reports uh, through companies that I don't work for, but I'm able to get that research and look at the data. Uh, and this one was really interesting to me is that uh, the CBS, again, we just talked about that, um, but the CBS 699 and the BHMT increase cysteine while glutathione slows the cysteine into cysteine into glutathione conversion, which we just showed in Dr. Ben Lynch. So, you know, these, these all of these companies, they're, they're, they're coming to the same conclusion. So this one, um, variants in the SOD gene, um, it comes down to iron. So a lot of people with Lyme disease or chronic Lyme are showing they're anemic or they're having issues with iron, or they have parasites that are pulling their iron, or they're having, you know, other heavy metals that are, uh, you know, messing with their iron absorption. So, you know, glutathione is, is a key. Uh, all of the, the functional doctors I've used have had a glutathione supplement in my routine because we can see genetically and we can see through all these chronic Lyme studies that we need to have that to help detox, to help pull things through our body. So again, there's there's all of this data out there. So if you have your, you know, your raw DNA, you can look some of these things up or you can, um, you know, there's all these companies out there and it's really not as expensive as most people think, you know, to have your genetics. So if you had the 23 and me or Ancestry to look for that, you can download your raw data. Now I will share 23 and me because of their data breach was not allowing people to get their data. So if you go into your account, you can go download raw data. If it's not an option, you can call them or email them and they will send it to you. So they're not keeping it. They're just not openly sharing it. And if you've had Ancestry, you can again, go into your account and download your raw data. And then you can either upload that to companies yourself or you can work through somebody like me where we can further analyze uh, that data. So the, the SOD gene, um, back to that, um, it has to do with copper and zinc. And I had a client recently, she was like, you know, I, I we we're in a Facebook group and she's like, you know, I, I really think I've got copper and zinc issues. Your story's pretty similar, you know, and we're able to look at that um, if you have copper and zinc, it may, may be a toxin or build up as a toxin. And a lot of um, tremors, some things that look similar to epilepsy sometimes are often copper um, because it can build up in your brain. It can build up in your eyes. It can build up in your liver. Uh, so some of that are these gene issues that your body, you know, just does not know what to do with some of these things, these, these metals, these minerals. Um, and the interesting to note is there's so many things with ALS and Lyme disease that are uh, in genetics that, you know, I, I know that I've, I've read books of the people being treated with hyperbaric oxygen chamber therapy that are, you know, lowering their ALS symptoms. I know that people that are finally being treated with Lyme disease are they're lowering those symptoms as well. Um, sometimes MS is misdiagnosed. And so, you know, there are all these things with Lyme and chronic Lyme that are just overlapping, but it comes down to these gene issues. So, um, there's 200 mutations in the SOD1 gene that have been found in ALS, muscle weakness, uh, muscle mass, inability to control movement. Uh, and sometimes those are also linked to undiagnosed Lyme disease patients. So, you know, again, track your symptoms, you know, really advocate for yourself with your doctors. Um, this is just a quick, what the pharmacogenetics report, if you have an older 23andMe, you might be able to get it. So the CYPT2C19, the SLBCO1, those are very important on your liver and your kidney metabolism. So it tells you what drugs, if you're a rapid metabolizer. So for me, all of the reflux medicines I was on, my kidneys were processing them too fast. So therefore they weren't working for me. And then the SLBCO1, that is my liver. So my liver was actually holding onto this medication and Unfortunately, my mother has the same issue and she just had a test and her doctor's like, you have all this, this medication is sitting in your liver. And I was like, well, yeah, I've been telling you that for four years that we have these genetic issues, but she unfortunately doesn't have doctors that want to listen to that. So, um, you know, knowing these can really tell how your body's processing medication and then you can choose what medications you can use or get alternatives or work with your doctors.
So we're going to open up to some questions here. Um, let me see. Okay, so I'm going to start with, with what was in, in the message here, and then I'll, I'll open it up a little bit more. Um, Belinda asked, uh, hair mineral test can be if your hair is colored. So yes, when you do the hair mineral testing, um, and I am an affiliate with, with uh, Dr. Wendy Myers. I don't know if I get a discount or not, but I can look into that because I just started an affiliate with them because it really did make a huge difference for me. Um, I used a, a health coach named Luba who was amazing. Like she's a, an intuitive healer. Like she knew more about me than I knew about myself and I never met her. So it was, it was pretty beautiful. Um, so when you do a hair mineral test, you cut your hair, like you just take a chunk close to your, to your scalp and, um, you just let them know if it is colored or what the product was. And then um, they do account for that. I'm not sure the science behind it, but whether you dye your hair or not, or what shampoo you use, they do factor that into the testing. So yes, you can have dyed hair. You can, you know, depending on what products you use, um, but they do ask you to do a specific thing as far as, you know, washing your hair or, you know, certain things before you do that testing. Um, I've had two done with two different companies. Um, in both of them, the results were 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 crazy. Like uh, as a professional photographer, it, I, in college and in high school, I was in a dark room, so I was exposed to silver uh, chemicals. And twenty years later, my hair mineral test showed that I had silver toxicity. So I, I didn't know that my body just held on to so many things. And, you know, that's what I did for a career and I was breathing it in, but I was also, you know, sometimes I didn't wear gloves or didn't use the tongs. And I, you know, I pull that I'm so excited for that image to develop. I'd pull it right out, not realizing that my body was holding on to that. So I would have never have known had I not had that hair mineral testing done. All right. So I am going to look just quickly so I can see that Peter said aspect of vitamin C, the GPD-6 gene deficiency, also vitamin C is a man-made absorbic acid made from aspergillus mold, often GMO corn. Yes. Uh, you know, so these, these, some of these supplements are man-made and there are a lot of preservatives in food. I know Peter and I've spoke that, um, your food's a little bit healthier, um, in as far as the process part in Australia, but yeah, those are the things that we need to look at is these, these man-made things that are in supplements that are, you know, they're filled with mold or filled with corn, um, that's genetically modified or it's, you know, it's full of toxins just from how it's harvest. Um, look at Peter getting in the chat there, which is great. Are there any other, I don't know if I can see if anyone raises hands, but you could throw in the chat. Does anyone have any, any questions as far as the genes or anything related to that? Okay. We can always come back to that. And um, I will get you guys all my contact information. You can email me, you can connect with me online. Just double check in here. So I can share here um, just some other chronic factors for a Lyme, um, comorbidities, co-infections, they're often missed if you have other diseases, uh, you know, if you have diabetes or other infections, um, delayed diagnosis, sometimes driven by insurance uh, status, as well as your location. Um, statistically in America, most patients drive two to six hours to find a doctor that even understands Lyme. Um, in the 70s and 80s, if they trade in Lyme, they would be thrown in jail or lose their medical license. Um, similar to things that are happening with COVID or happened with COVID. Um, it's very it, it's sad. Um, corticosteroids, often exposures, worsen outcomes. So sometimes the medications people are given because they're misdiagnosed also can factor into that chronic Lyme. Uh, misdiagnosis, lack of access to Lyme literate doctors. Uh, immune response. That's a big thing for chronic Lyme. 
Um, before I go into connecting, um, I just want to share that, you know, some of the first things that you can do is eliminate things that are, we know are bad, right? The inflammatory foods, the environmental toxins, you know, those are things you can do to detox your body is to lessen that burden. Um, a lot of processed foods have a lot of additives, preservatives that are harder for everybody to digest, whether you know your food sensitivities or not. Um, getting enough water, hydration, um, making sure you have bowel movements, exercise. I know for myself, that was really hard with Lyme and I'm not a big exercise person anyway, um, but moving, whether it's just moving your feet in the chair or moving your shoulders that can help stimulate some things in your body to help that detox, um, saunas. I know some, um, gyms memberships give, you know, allow you to use their sauna swimming, you know, different ways to move your body, you know, can really start that detox process before, you know, you get into the supplements or you get into, you know, the, the, the medications or protocols. So, you know, it, little things make a big difference and, you know, I can help you, you know, figure out where to start. Um, we do have a Facebook group for, um, chronic ill, it was for women, but we changed it because we, we have some, some men in there now, but um, we do have a Facebook group that, um, you know, we like to share different things in and I will be more active in, um, that is my goal for this year and for March. So, you know, I would love to connect um, on Facebook. I, I am under coach Wendy Jean. Um, my business is clicks for a cause. We do photography. Well, we did photography. Then we went into coaching and now we're doing photography as well. Um, so clicks for a cause used to be photography is clicking. And now, uh, because we, don't, we worked with nonprofits now clicking in the causes for people that are looking for help for support, either Lyme disease or chronic illness. Um, if you go on, I would love for you to go on and do a review. I'd love for you to go on and share. I will be doing more of these events in the future. Um, you can use the hashtag Lyme Warrior or Chronic Lyme Disease to help really connect the conversation. Um, you know, raising awareness together is, is where we're, we're going to be. Um, for Lyme resources on my website, you can go to clicks for a cause slash info. That's where I have some of my podcasts, some of the links to the doctors um, that I am affiliated with. Um, and then you can also go to the clicks for a cause slash line that shows for some of my events. And then if you want to connect with me further, um, there's a form on there you could fill out. I do free line mentor calls. So if you want to have a follow up conversation or just a conversation for someone that's been there, um, it's, it's not specifically for my services at all. It's just to talk about Lyme and your journey. Um, I do offer free calls for, for Lyme mentors. And what I can do for you um, is going forward there, if you're interested, the my mentor calls, um, it's a free call, 30 minute call. Um, you know, you can text, you can chat as well. Um, but I am a certified holistic uh, genetic health coach. So I'm a health coach, which is mind, body, spirit. We look at the body as a whole, uh, but I specifically go in deeper to that and look for for genetics. So we can, I can analyze your raw DNA. I can supply saliva DNA kits um, that take five to eight weeks. Uh, but if you have your raw data, I can get you a report within a week. Um, if you want to do it on your own, you can get a report within an hour uh, as a self-decode client on your own and then connect with me, you know, as needed. So I, I try to be very flexible on how I can help and support um, because there are all these options out there now with 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 these uh, amazing programs. Um, I do have a Clicks for a Cause boutique. Uh, during my Lyme journey, I really did a lot of art therapy. Um, cause I was an artist and I, you know, I was bedridden for so long and I needed an outlet. So I started to garden and grew my own flowers. Uh, and then I photographed them with a macro lens. So I photograph bugs or flowers or blossoms. Um, and then I have some, uh, toxic free products, candles, uh, it's the first candle I could use, uh, in years because I was so sensitive. So I used my artwork, um, for some non-toxic products, uh, on my, on my, uh, boutique, which is, uh, super exciting because as a Lyme advocate, as well as an artist, you know, I've found a way to kind of merge those, those passions. Uh, genetic analysis. So if you have strat gene or you have other genetic reports and you need help making sense of it, that is something that I can do as well. We could set up a call or a zoom. Um, you send me your reports ahead of time. I'll pull some information out that I think is relevant to Lyme disease specifically. Um, and then we can create a plan. Or if you have the information, but you're struggling to, 
you know, with, with all of the information from your doctor, or all the information from reports or not knowing where to start, um, we can kind of dig through, you know, what's, what's the biggest priority for you or accessibility. Sometimes it's not, you know, switching to organic foods, not an option. Um, I know I have a five foot section in my grocery store, so it's, it, I don't even have much access to, to that. I grow a garden, but I live in an area with high cadmium and I live in an area with a nuclear power plant. So having a garden is not the best option for me either because I don't have good soil. So, you know, we can kind of talk through different ways that are, are best for supporting your journey. Uh, I do have some more events coming up. So uh, again, if you have your raw data, ancestry, other genetics, um, I am going to do a, a three-day workshop. I trying to get the time to fit America in Australia. Uh, it's a little bit earlier in the morning for Australia, but a little bit in the afternoon for America to, to do that. Um, and we're going to look at practical strategies, treatment options, lifestyle modifications, more into the genetic pieces of specifically what's that mean. So like where Dr. Ben Lynch says, you know, let's take out, uh, you know, certain toxins or let's add in supplements. So we'll go over that specifically. Um, I do have some options on there. Um, so it starts at 2 p.m. That's Eastern Standard Time. Um, I do have some tickets on there that are free because I understand, you know, most of us have spent all of our money trying to heal. So I do have some free tickets to that. Um, the regular tickets are $97 for three days. And then I do have a VIP uh, experience where if you have your genetic testing and you're interested in working with me as a practitioner, you can get your genetic analysis and the tickets included. So you can have your reports. If you have your raw DNA, we can next week, as early as next week, go over, set up an appointment, go over your reports. And then during this um, three-day treatment or three-day treatment, three-day um, event, you can really understand your genetic reports that we go over in this event. Um, I am going to have some other practitioners and other Lyme patients on there as well. Uh, so we do have that. And then if anyone here is on the other side of healing or knows somebody that might be interested in health coaching, I, I studied under Mind Body Green, which is um, Dr. Mark Hyman, um, you know, and a, Dr. Will Cole out of Pittsburgh. Uh, and these really true uh, great professionals that were in the conventional world that went into holistic medicine, um, Dr. Stephen Gundry. Um, but Mind Body Green does have a new class coming up. Um, I do get a $750 discount and they are actually giving their nutritional program free with that as well. So if you're interested in doing that, I can give you a link as well as my discount code. If you know anyone's looking at getting into this career, it is, it is a supposed to be a three trillion dollar industry by 2025 uh, I believe it I think a lot of people are now looking at their health and looking at it you know from more of a holistic standpoint uh, here is a QR code to my website um, you guys can check it out um, I know all of you registered for the event so you have been to the website uh, but I have lots of different tools on there. I have lots of different things coming up on there um, this year as far as a paid group where we'll have different events every month or different speakers. We do have a free group that I just started for Lyme patients that you could go on and join. And it's meant to be more of a positive. I know sometimes the online groups get a little bit um, not so fun um, because everyone's healing and some people are angry and some people, you know, have no hope, but, you know, I want, I want my Lyme group to be a, a positive for everybody. So I want to, to thank everybody, um, everybody that's here and everybody that's going to be here later. So I will, I will again, send that email out so you can watch this again. I will have this available on my site. Um, so I see Peter's asking about the gene testing and I will say if anyone wants to speak, um, we have a few more minutes. I can, you can unmute if Peter, if you want to talk or, um, I know Jill's a, a Lyme warrior and advocate if she's still on here. I can't see who's on here or not. Um, but I do know the answer to that, Peter, as far as um, if I can find it here, who's had genetic testing. Um, and I, I, it looks like the, no, I don't, I don't want to say that specifically. The one paper I need that I don't have. 
but I did ask that questionnaire on um, the registration. So I know who has genetic testing or how to get it. So I will make sure and reach out to all of you. Um, so, you know, if you've had testing and you want to work with me, we can talk afterwards or privately. Um, or if you're interested in genetic testing, we do test, uh, or sorry, send the test kits uh, all but just a few countries. So even if you are in Australia, I could send you a self-decode kit. And then in five to eight weeks, you could have results and answers. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a great, I think it's the future of, of healthcare and medicine is, is, you know, knowing your genetics and having a good, good path. Uh, Barbara, I see um, your note here. So thank you. Um, this is, this is my goal this year is to speak and advocate and share for Lyme. So I, I hope that, uh, uh, you know, you take some things from here. Um, and Belinda says, I have ancestry done, never looked at the raw data. So definitely go in and download your raw data, go into your account file, um, and you'll see a thing in there for raw data. Um, it'll download a zip file, and then you can either choose to go through some companies yourself or, you know, through me. Um, if you want to use certain companies, I do get discounts. So if you don't want to work with me directly, I can get you a discount if you like the science and want to do it on your own. Uh, but there, there is such a, a, a huge world of things that can unlock from that. And, you know, we never know with internet and data and companies. So I would always recommend get your data, put it on a, a you know, a, a flash drive, put it in the safe, keep it somewhere. Um, and it's not like it used to be. It used to be people were scared about, you know, the information and the data. But I look at it this way. I had a child. I had an organ removed. If if someone wanted to clone me, they probably already did. So, you know, I try not to get scared about the that part of it. But, you know, at this point, it's 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 data and it's all relevant data. Um, and Barb, thank you for sharing a little bit about, you know, with your daughter. I know she's she's near and dear to, to, to me and to you and, um, you know, with her epilepsy and, you know, her TBI and, you know, there's, uh, you know, that the, the, our children, I mean, I not only do this for myself and for all of you, you know, as adults and, and majority of you women, um, but for our kids as well. So if we have genetic issues, you know, those could be passed on to our children. So my, my son is not going to have to, you know, have all of this, like, he, he was initially misdiagnosed from his line, but I knew as a parent, I knew as a line patient, I knew as a genetic expert, what he could be battling. I knew how to advocate for his self, his health. I knew that there was food sensitivities that he may have that were causing his issues or his acne or, you know, his, he was dealing with anxiety. So it's not only helpful for us, but also helpful for, for our kids and our children. And, you know, if, if anyone needs to speak just as a mom or an advocate, I am here. Um, I've, I've been through it as a patient. I've been through it as a mom. I've been through it as a spouse. I've been through it as an aunt. I've been through it as a friend. Uh, so, you know, I, I know sometimes it's, it's a long, feels like a lonely journey, but I, I promise it doesn't have to. Um, and I encourage all of you to share your story. I know oftentimes we, we go within or, you know, we kind of shut down with what we're going through, but um, trauma is a big thing in healing that I, I really didn't address today, but whether your trauma response can be genetic as well, but, um, you know, dealing with trauma and dealing with, you know, getting over the fact that if your doctors didn't listen to you, or your friends and family didn't listen to you, you know, it, it took me a while to come to the point that it doesn't matter what they believe or what they think, because I live it. Um, and if they can't support me, then I have to accept that that's, they're not in the capacity to do that. Um, but I can share with people who are in that capacity or people like you that, you know, want to hear my story. So, um, you know, that trauma and that stress response is also a big piece in, in you know, really healing in, the, in that chronic Lyme too. I, I see that a lot in the groups that people are angry and they're bitter and, and I, and I get that. Um, but it's also something that we have to get past and those in, in the group that say you have to have a positive mindset. I, I mean, they're right. Um, you have to believe you can heal. That is the first step in healing is you have to believe that it's possible. Otherwise, you're going to have that chip on your shoulder every day that's keeping you back and having that negative self-talk. So, you know, I encourage all of you, if you haven't seen some of my other podcasts, check them out, um, connect with me online um, and, you know, reach out to, to any of us that are on here or, you know, in the groups because, you know, we've, we've all been through it or we're currently in it and you know supporting each other is is very key so i'm just going to say if there's anything else in the comments i'm going to stop sharing my screen
um, so that way I can see everything. And thank you for everybody that's joining. I know it's hard, you know, with Lyme to, to commit and to, to show up. So thank you for, for doing that for yourself, not for me, but for yourself. Um, and those of you that are watching this on a replay, welcome. I, I'm glad that you're able to see this. And um, I would like to do another one of these free events, um, you know, later on in the month. So if you have, you know, again, some feedback for me, I will share an email asking for that. Um, and then if you have other people that might be interested in joining, um, you know, let's connect that way. And, you know, I hope to do something specifically with Peter and his group um, to, to help them as well, because, you know, my heart breaks for anyone that's misdiagnosed with Lyme or that's dealing with Lyme, but, you know, my doctors didn't acknowledge it in, you know, having, an, it, at least it's acknowledged in the United States, not to what it should be, but, you know, living in an area that doesn't even acknowledge it, I, I can't imagine how much of a, a you know, a, a emotional burden and, and, and burden it is just on your body to not have that support. So, um, any way that me or any of my other fellow line people are on here, you know, I, I do appreciate everybody. So I will have a summary um, from my cool AI because, you know, that's the world these days that I'll send to you and then a follow up on some other things um, that I have coming up in ways that I can support you. And um, if, if any of you want to advocate, uh, whether you're in, in the U.S. or even in Australia, um, you know, that is a big uh, passion of mine is um, advocating and, you know, Pennsylvania, there's lots of things here um, that we're trying to push for legislation. Hey, I see you, Peter. Um, let me, let me unmute you here. Hi there. That, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for all the time and effort you put into this. And thank you so much for considering Australia as well, because this is a time we can get come here, but maybe being the Saturday here, people having days off perhaps <laughs> who knows and that's quite that right. brilliant. and I'd, I'd love to add the fact that many people don't consider getting a genetic test done I kind of see why would I need to get that done but you've really explained so many reasons why getting a gen genetic test can help with your overall treatment as well because many of us sort of read things online and talk to our doctors and then take all these supplements under the sun, but those supplements may not be good for us or maybe the wrong type. So right. understanding that genetics can really help your underlying health before you even even perhaps getting the need to get your body healthier before you even start treatment and, and genetics and understanding your epigenetics would be really beneficial for it. So thank you for presenting that and hopefully more people will be convinced to get a genetic test done, but then more importantly, is getting somebody like yourself to greatly understand what all of those things mean. I mean, I don't. I've got a general understanding, but someone like yourself who's gone in depth in all of that is really needed um, to get you better. Thank you. And yeah, and, and you and I will connect, you know, after and 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 share with everybody. And, uh, it, you know, it, it's... Uh, you know, I was always resentful for having Lyme, but it, it changed my life in such a positive way. And, you know, I, I, I never thought that this would be my path and, you know, I, I'm blessed that it is. And it, it, it's one of those things I always share in my podcasts is that when my body didn't work, my brain did. And when my brain did, my body didn't, but these are the things that I was, I was able to understand. So, you know, being able to use those to help others, you know, makes, what my darkest days were absolutely worth it. So um, yeah, there's hope. That's always what I try to leave, leave all my presentations with is there is, there is hope. And, um, and hopefully I can help that even if it's a friendly ear or, you know, to provide some information, but, and I, and for those of you that are on here that came here from Peter, I mean, I even learned so much from you and in, in all of your posts. So I want to thank you for, for sharing this event and, and what you're posting and for, for my, American counterparts on here, um, conquering chronic illness um, and the tick-borne illness. It is on a, in Australia, but Peter shares some amazing things. Um, he's a researcher like me. Um, so, you know, if, if it's okay for them to find you, you know, I will throw that out there. Um, but yeah, just yeah. some fascinating stuff that, that you're able to share as well. And, and I know we're not, I'm not in the same country, but we, we have some of the same battles and we do have some more research and some things. So, you know, anyone that's, that's not from here, you know, reach out to me. I, and I'm just this, this new technology and some of the things that COVID opened up that we can connect this way to me is just, is super, super awesome. So. Yeah, definitely. 
All right. Well, unless anyone has any other questions, um, this is the first time that I am only five minutes over on time. So I am super excited. I tend to, you know, talk a little bit too much. So um, that's, that's fantastic. But again, feel free to reach out. I'm just going to throw my email in the chat. Um, and for those of you, if you're not familiar with Zoom, if you go into the three little dots underneath the chat, you can save the chat. So you can either save my email address or just save the chat feed. And then, um, you know, you can reach out to me. Uh, again, I will send a follow-up to everybody. Um, but if you, you know, want to reach out to me in the meantime, um, my inbox is always open. And then, Peter, I hope next week for you and I to connect on some things um, and sure. then, you know, keep going forward. And um, yeah, I want to thank everybody again for for coming and I hope that I can connect with with any of you in, in any way. And, you know, again, also connect with Peter because he's 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 fighting for all of you in, in Australia and just doing all this research with us. So. Excellent. All right. Well, everyone have a good night in America and a good day in Australia, which is, is still mind blowing to me. I'm so fascinated by it. And, and one day I will I will I will get to hopefully meet you in person because that's always been on my list to, to go to Australia. So you're always welcome. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right, everybody. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.